Woe to you of earth and sea. Welcome to Satan is My Superhero, a show for atheists, scoffers, heathens, and unbelievers. I'm your host, Judas Falling. In this episode, we're interviewing a former anti-vaxxer and hope to shed some light on the other side of the story. For many of us, it is hard to comprehend in the statistics-driven world that some of our fellow citizens can remain so willfully ignorant in the face of overwhelming data. This episode is a follow-up to the last episode, A Pox to You, where we compared and contrasted the anti-vax movement of today with the hysterical response to smallpox inoculations in a world filled with witches and demons 300 years ago. If you haven't listened to a Pox to You episode yet, I highly recommend you go back after this one and have a listen. It has a lot of information relevant to this discussion, and it is an honest representation of the format this podcast usually follows, which, while being fact-based, is predominantly viewed through the lens of irreverent comedy. Irreverent? I would describe it more as juvenile. And with all that said, I'd like to introduce today's guest. It is Mrs. Satan is my superhero herself, otherwise known as Lexi. Lexi, hello. Judas. Welcome to the show. Thank you. For the first time ever. No one here, no one's ever heard your voice before on this show. <laughs> I know, but it's different being me and my voice, you know, in the raw rather than doing a silly character in a sketch. The characters are not silly. I mean, <laughs> sorry. They are very, very serious. Yes, I spend many hours developing those characters. We do. We workshop them then, Stanislavski style. That's right. And those accents are really good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, look, normally at this stage and in the interview, the host should really spend time introducing the guest and letting them talk about themselves for a while. But we've got a whole bunch of questions to get through, and I think we'll cover all the introductions and backgrounds through the uh, medium of the questions that are being asked. Now, we source these questions online. I went on my Twitter, got a few. You went on some Facebook groups. Would you like to talk about those just before we get started? Yeah, I've, you know, as a former anti-vaxxer, I'm sort of, it's, you know, an interest still, I guess, that world. So I'm a member of quite a few different on Facebook and Reddit and different, you know, groups of pro-vax and anti-vax and where that meets. And yeah, I just put out a question months ago. Would anyone sort of be interested and what would people want to ask? And, you know, I think both of us just got inundated with questions. Yeah. And so I, I think a lot of people who were anti-vax and if they change, they, they keep it on the down low because, you know, it's, I'm a little nervous. I'm putting out all my, all my failings out there. <laughs> no, that's fair. That's fair. TT's has got a lot of these questions for us, so she'll be asking the question. Okay. I think let's jab the needle into this thing and uh, start with our first question. Okay, let's go. From listener SN. What percentage of your extended family and friends growing up and now were also anti-vax? I guess, just sort of, I guess, as a caveat for starters, is that I was born a very long time ago, because I'm very old, in 1982 in Christchurch, New Zealand. So um, I lived there till I was 10 and then moved to Australia in 92. And yes, my entire family, family friends, and then as I became older, my friendship group and social group were all anti-vax and everything, I guess, that goes with that, very much into alternative medicine, psychic powers, spiritual stuff, sort of, not so much religious. So yeah, it was 100% a bubble. And to me, you know, especially before, you know, the internet, it didn't even really occur to me that I was in a weird, I guess that's part of being in the bubble. You don't know you're in the bubble. So my normal was just that people didn't vaccinate. I knew other people did, but everyone I knew didn't vaccinate or said they wouldn't vaccinate, you know, even if they had been as kids. From listener PB, what was your parents' decision based on? Um, I guess we need to go back another generation, really. And because you were born into this bubble, so it's not like something you, you know, you got indoctrinated into. You were simply born into it. What were your parents' uh, views on vaccination? Were you told why you weren't being vaccinated? Were you even been told you weren't being vaccinated? Like, is the bubble so enveloping that it's not even talked about? What was the discussion at home, I guess? At the time, just an only child, mum and dad. My 
I believe both my parents had been vaccinated, had sort of had pretty standard sort of upbringings and lives with, you know, modern medicine. The story I was told is I was given one vaccination or it's it's hard to know, but I have tried to go back and look up what that might have been back in, you know, the 80s in Christchurch in New Zealand. And it's hard to find that information. The story I was told is I was given a vaccination as a baby and I had a reaction to it. As I went on in life and saw each time I would have a reaction to certain things that particularly my mum, who became very heavily into alternative medicine, the reaction could be a rash. So, I, you know, that very first one, I don't know what happened to me, but from what I saw later, I gather it would not have been a, you know, life or death sort of reaction. So that was sort of my not being vaccinated. That was my understanding of it. But what that sort of bled into quite quickly is I think by the time I was three months old, I think, my mum who'd been breastfeeding, couldn't breastfeed me anymore and decided, and I'm not sure if this is even true or not, as in medically true, the reason I cried so much, you know, like babies do is because I was allergic to formula that they had. So she shipped in raw soy milk into New Zealand in 1982, which didn't ex- like there was no you know soy milk at the supermarket, and it was apparently like this grey sludge in a bottle. It wasn't a formula, and I was put on that from about three months old. So that kind of gives you, I guess, an idea of what the headspace was. And I, from that point, I you know was a very sickly baby and child and adult have been very sick. I didn't have antibiotics. I didn't, you know, I just didn't get any of the science and modern medicine. And where that came from generationally, I'm not 100% sure. My dad, I think, wasn't 100%. I don't know if he was not on board, but I think he was just sort of like, oh, you know, whatever. He wasn't so opposed to it. For my mum, I think it was a period of time where she was, I think, sort of rediscovering herself. She went down a different route herself in a career. So she started, she'd been in a corporate job. She'd started around the same time retraining in natural health. And the story sort of I was told is I was a very sickly baby and a very sickly kid and I was sick all the time. And I think to give her credit, she truly believed this and she part of why she retrained and went down this road of aromatherapy and Reiki and herbal medicine and kinesiology was to help me. Yeah. Again, I don't think I've had the chance to have antibiotics and other modern medicine, but I, that's, I'm not, you know, I could talk about what I might think the psychology behind that all is, but she really believed, I think at the time she was doing what was best. And I think there was, a, you know, I think it became quite fashionable sort of at that time coming into the 80s, certainly, you know, which I imagine that we'll discuss. I'm sure there are questions about, there's a lot of privilege in being able to even experiment with this. I can't tell you exactly why it all happened, but that's sort of my understanding anyway. It certainly wasn't like third, fourth generation anti-vaxxers, anti-science at all. It was sort of just her that started it, I think. From listener TA, do you think it might have been Dunning-Kruger effect going on? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, I can personally relate to that as I got older and started thinking about this sort of thing myself as not literally not knowing that I didn't know so much. And, you know, my mum had a sort of need to go out and be be different and unique and alternative, I guess, where she was getting her information. Yeah, so this would have been like 80s, early 90s, you know, thinking my sort of childhood time in New Zealand. Oh, I mean, you know, she read a lot of books. I did find, I was just going through like my old boxes of stuff to see what I could find and found some like really horrific anti-vax rhetoric, including a book that she gave me when I was older. It was printed and reprinted in 91 called What the Doctors Don't Tell You. And it's a booklet just all about how you know, vaccines cause everything possible that's bad. So, yeah, I believe she she started studying. I think she started in massage. So I imagine her social group also then grew into other, to be blunt, sort of middle-class, privileged white women who were able to go on this sort of journey of experimentation and try all these alternatives. My memory of her and, you know, my experience is she's never trusted science, doctors, politicians. I mean, some of those, I think, you know, I think it's good to have a bit of a healthy distrust, particularly maybe politicians, but she's never been interested in any of that. She has her own opinions. Where she gets that knowledge from, I don't exactly know, but she's very clear in it, 
either way. From listener JM, did you see yourself as separate to the community around you? Did you think your decisions helped or harmed the human race as a whole or did you not consider it? Do you think ego played a role in your decisions? I mean, I'll answer it first, you know, from a child perspective. Yes, I do think ego 100% plays a part because obviously my mum's a very intelligent person and along the way she would have come across information that contradicted her beliefs. My personal belief is, yeah, it's certainly, it's an ego thing as to not being able to be open to new ideas, I guess, or even to examine them or hear them. For myself, I don't think I ever really thought about if I was impacting people's health as a kid or even as a teenager. It's interesting, like, I do remember when I was about seven, it's not, you know, exactly the same, but I remember being seven and in New Zealand and suddenly, like, realising that the lambs in the field that I loved was the lamb that I ate. And from that point on, I was just like, I'm a vegetarian. And however many years later, I'm still a vegetarian. I did become aware and I remember arguing with my parents and being like, well, if I don't eat meat, there'll be less people buying meat at the supermarket, which will then go on and impact the world and less lambs will die. So it's interesting. I did start to have some sort of concept, I guess, of how things you might do have an effect on other people. But even though I did get lots of illnesses and I spread them to people, it's interesting. I don't remember as a kid or teen ever really considering that maybe that was uncool of me or that it was on me and that, yeah, I don't know. I was just very much consumed with anyone who isn't like us is like they're the people with Dunning-Kruger. Like it's really sad that they don't realise how terrible it is putting vaccines into their children or into themselves or they're poisoning themselves with antibiotics and if only they knew, you know, how wonderful like kinesiology is and you can heal things with crystals. And I felt sorry for people who didn't do that, if anything. But yeah, I mean, I guess as a kid, you don't spend a lot of time thinking about your impact on other people. And also I moved, we moved house every year or two. I went to lots of different schools, lived in two different countries as a kid. I don't know, we didn't have, I didn't have, I mean, I had friends for short periods of time, but I didn't get to know people like long term enough that I guess it would even come up that, I mean, I was always the weird kid for various reasons. (laughs) Apart from the fact I was sick all the time and I missed so much school. But yeah, I don't remember being like, oh, me not, you know, being vaccinated and the fact that I just got, you know, the mumps is why... You know, my dad just got the mumps and he was sick for like four months and in bed and really ill. That's because of me or choices that I've made. I don't remember thinking that. No, not as a kid. And I think the takeaway from there is that lambs are more cute than humans. From listener PM, was it expected for you to carry on the anti-vax stance with your own children? Yeah, absolutely. I remember, I guess, in that sort of period from leaving, you know, the home, I moved out at 17 and I guess before sort of the in-between stage, I remember getting two cats when I was mm, 19, which were my first sort of pets as a an adult out by myself in the world. And, you know, I'd always grown up, we'd always had cats. And I remember speaking to, asking my mum about vaccinating and she said, oh, this is like so bad, but she was like, well, you know, you wouldn't vaccinate a person. Like, you don't give the cats, you know, the vaccinations. So I didn't. I believe they'd had the ones as kittens, you know, when you first get them. And they were neutered. I was on board with that for some reason. I thought that, like, I don't know. It's interesting how you compartmentalize at the time. But so I guess that was my first foray into that as my first, you know, babies, (laughs) my cats. As a note, don't worry, I I actually had to give them away a year or so later for unrelated reasons. And they did get vaccinated. So it was all okay. And yeah, so then when I was 21, I became unexpectedly pregnant. And apart from the fact that, you know, my boyfriend at the time was very much anti-vax and our whole social group was, it was really, it wasn't even a discussion from my family's point of view that I would vaccinate, from my mum anyway. My parents had split up by that point. But if it came up, it was more just about how she'll back me up in case any doctors try and pressure me into it. And uh, interesting, we sort of missed this a bit earlier, talking about moving from uh, New Zealand from Christchurch to uh, Sydney in Australia and you were in a bubble in Christchurch although you moved around a lot like you say yeah and so that bubble may have been particularly family orientated but 
I think an interesting note, especially for uh, any Sydney listeners here, is that what suburb did you move to when you came to Sydney? And look, there's people right now already laughing because they already know what your answer is going to be, judged on what you've already said. But <laughs> for, for those of us, for those of us not from Sydney, please tell us what was the suburb. Well, we initially moved to a different suburb, but the suburb I lived in throughout my teenage years and into my early twenties was in the nineties in Sydney. It's Newtown, which was an inner city. At the time, I don't know so much now. Oh, it's been very gentrified now. But at the time... It was very cool and alternative and punk a bit. And I went to... The high school I went to was a performing arts high school where I was a drama student. It was great, but it was 100% its own bubble of not necessarily any vaxxers or any science, but just a very different experience to, I think, 99% of people in first world countries going to high school or even in the next suburb to Newtown here in Sydney it's a completely different world it really was yeah it was a great there was a lot of great things about it but it was a lot of dreadlocks on white people a lot that's what I remember it from the 90s I skipped that oh my god I'm so like thank you thank you I'm so grateful I always wanted dreads and now I'm be like oh yeah, no, a lot of heavy, a lot of um, wearing petticoats that you buy from Glebe Markets over like flared cords, a lot of drugs. Drugs are a big part. And interestingly, in that world, it's so funny, there was so much, everybody smoked cigarettes, people drank alcohol, there was a lot of illegal drug taking, but you wouldn't buy soap that wasn't organic or ethically sourced and you wouldn't have any additives in it and everything that you would buy to eat had to be from like macro whole foods and yet we would go out and take god knows what at the weekend from some random white dude with dreads <laughs> so hypocritical so it was own type of bubble 100 percent. yeah from listener em how did you view parents who did vaccinate their kids again until i became pregnant at 21 i don't really remember having an opinion other than I guess when I was younger, if it came up, really probably more my parents talking about it. If anything, I felt sorry for them. But I don't know, probably once I moved to Sydney, I'm, I think most of my friends would have been vaccinated. But, you know, it was a different time and that today, even, you know, before COVID, I think vaccines are just talked about a lot more. People, even kids and teens, they have opinions or they discuss it. It really wasn't talked about at all if it, anything like that did come up, it wasn't even so much necessarily vaccinations, but just sort of normal like medicine or like why are you taking that those weird herbs like in a brown bottle three times a day? And I was just more embarrassed because I wasn't like everybody else. But I definitely don't remember judging anyone at all about it. From listener JL, did you distrust the entire medical slash pharmacology field or just vaccines? Again, it's sort of different from as a kid and a teenager where I guess most of us sort of just believe, you know, our parents believe, 100% the entire medical field. I mean, having said that, my, my parents would be like, there's, would always be like, there's a place for modern medicine. You know, I'm an asthmatic, so I did have, you know, a Ventolin. There were times I went in, a, as a teenager, I had an anaphylactic reaction and went into hospital and they gave me, I don't really remember, I was out of it, but, you know, all the things they give you. And that was never like an issue, of course, you know, I was dying. So there was always, it wasn't just, I guess it was, to be honest, I think it's sort of more when it was convenient that there's a place for hospitals and there's a place for modern medicine. But, you know, first you do everything you can to treat things with stuff that isn't medicine, basically. And never really got to the point of even if I'd had pneumonia for seven weeks and it was my third time that year, we never quite got to the point because I could still just take herbs and things happen. And, you know, they might have, they would help a bit. Would they? Well, I don't know. I mean, yes. I mean. I do. I guess. (laughs) I used to drink this. Oh, my gosh. I drank it like so often, different concoctions three times a day they went with me everywhere these little brown bottles and they would stain and it was just like I do, I don't know why I wasn't cool honestly I don't know why I was so weak <laughs> but you know they'd make you hack stuff up I remember that they tasted bad like so you kind of felt like they're doing something 
I don't know. I feel like maybe some of those, you know, there, there may be arguments compared to some of the other stuff like homeopathy and kinesiology and like looking at things and literally holding a container of food in the container and having someone test the strength of your arm and deciding if you have an allergy to it or not. So, you know, I think there's a bit of a continuum. Some of those medicines, I think they're originally meant to be complementary and that some stuff in that world I think can work as a complementary I'm looking at your face and you're like, no, massage. Your, your massage isn't you know, a medicine. I mean, people, you know, people who are really into it think it's a, it's a type of... Like, I mean, you know, it makes people feel good. I mean, no one goes there like, I have a cold, like, can you massage? Actually, no, people do. I'm sure people do. People do know. And I'm sure there's, there's people out there who offer that service. Do you have a cold? Let me touch you. Actually, I do remember there was a lymphatic drainage... Do you remember that? I mean, you wouldn't remember it. I mean, it was a thing. I think it's not a thing now. And it was sort of just stroking on the arms that was meant to drain. Drain the lymphatic <laughs> system to where? Like you ended up with big pudgy fingers, bulbous <laughs> fingers that had to be pricked with a needle and like, what? No, no. I don't know. If that it's, it, you know what? If it's not going nowhere, it's not going nowhere. Look, I'm, again, this is not, this was, a, I just remember it being done to me along with, you know, Many other things that weren't really medicine, I guess, at all. From listener AA, as an anti-vaxxer, did you ever decline other medical care or medication? Yes. Again, sort of, you know, zero to ten. I don't remember. I'm sure I did see a doctor at some point. I really have no memory of ever seeing any medical professional whatsoever. My parents split up when I was 12. And then after that, when I would be with my dad, like, I remember he wanted to take me overseas and, you know, they wanted me to get the in vaccinations that you need when I don't remember what they were exactly. But we were going to India and Nepal and Dubai and all very cool and exciting. Um, yeah, I think I was 12 or 13. I remember being in the doctor's office and being and me being, I was terrified. And I don't know if I was so much terrified of getting it or if I was terrified of, like, up letting my mum down or, you know. I knew that that was a bad and I shouldn't do it. And I remember there being a flurry of discussions and I must have got away with not doing it because, and I mean, I traveled, I don't know, this was early 90s, maybe you could get just a conscientious objection. And then again, on occasion throughout my teen years, again, if I was, you know, with my dad, there were times when he, I think I would go to a doctor or there'd be things that would come up and I'd have to be like, oh no, I can't have this. No, I can't have this. No, I can't have this. But then I guess as an adult, the thing that really comes to mind is when I had my son. Yeah, so I was like 22 when I had him. I had this idea of I'd actually secretly been researching vaccines on our, my first computer on the internet, but probably that will you know come up later. So I, I had secretly been, everyone around me is like, obviously you're not going to vaccinate and you won't get vitamin K even. You won't, you know, you just like... Don't let the doctors even touch your baby. And I went to the birth center and I'm like, you know, yeah, I did yoga and, you know, I'm just going to pop this baby out and it's going to be great and I'm going to have no medicine and no intervention. And, you know, it was a 44-hour labor and it was a disaster, like not a disaster. He came out okay, but I had to get lots of intervention. And my son had a pneumothorax when he was born, which means like he tore a hole in his lung. And straight away, sort of from that point on, there was, we want to give him, you know, vitamin K. We want to give him the hepatitis B injection. We want to give him antibiotics because he went straight to ICU because he has a hole in his lung. And I remember being very dazed and just given birth and exhausted. And his dad was with him and my mum was there and people were sort of helping me. But it was the first time I really remember like doctors and nurses being very aggressive, I guess, and... I, get, I hadn't really seen, I guess, just now looking like an understandable reaction, you know, looking at it now, like they're seeing this young mum who probably clearly has no idea what she's talking about, what she's doing, because I didn't. And, you know, I've always been someone who's more sort of malleable and maybe influenced by the people around me, especially when I was younger. And just that was the first time I just remember the I think he was the pediatrician, his face and the tone when I was just like, oh, no, you know, we're not going to do that. And I don't remember it sort of coming up in a 
big way. I guess I'd been protected as a kid and just the, yeah, the frustration and the disgust from their face. And again, I felt it and it wasn't, I remember the people around me like saying how, you know, how terrible the doctor was to make me feel like that. And, but I got, I remember sitting there, or, you know, lying there or whatever and feeling like, oh, maybe this is the wrong thing. Like I really saw it in their face, like not just like they're mad at me for no reason, but like they just, you know, helped get this baby out and get him out alive because it had ended up bad at the end. And I was at that point of like, oh, thank God. Anyway, I'd been transferred into the proper hospital and that's when like it really took off and everyone took care of me. And I was like, oh my God, thank the gods, like people are here who know what they're doing. And just, yeah, that was the first time I saw their face and I heard their tone about me not say no to vitamin K, no to vaccinations, no to antibiotics. And I remember and even in my dazed, exhausted state being like, wow, it was the first time. It was like a punch in the guts, but also a, oh, maybe this isn't the best thing for my baby. So that was probably the first big time. Again, I think you think about it quite differently when it's, it's one thing when it's your health. And again, if I hadn't had a kid so young, maybe I would have changed my opinion about myself over time. But all of a sudden, it's like this fresh baby that you're so in love with and so protective of. And there's so much riding on every little decision and choice you make that I really did heavily research it and look into it and try and understand it. But I did along the way come across a lot of anti-vax rhetoric that I didn't realize was that. Because you did do the study, even before this event, you were already, it sounds like you'd already started on the path. I had. You were definitely thinking about it. Yeah. And those faces from the pediatrician and likewise just confirmed a path you had already started yourself. In that early research, tell us, what did you come across? Like there was a lot of misinformation and like all misinformation sold as if it came from legitimate sources, but it didn't, did it? Yes. So... This was 2003 and 2004. I had the internet and I just started with just your average uh, Google, probably wasn't even Google search back then. Ask Jeeves or who who do we even have? (laughs) Yahoo or was it? I can't remember. Internet Explorer? I don't even know. (laughs) Yeah, Explorer it would have been, probably. Whatever that was, yeah. And I remember coming across, you know, like sort of the standard health website about these are the vaccinations. It It wasn't detailed like it is now. It was, you know, this is the vaccination, vaccination schedule. Nothing bad sort of ever happens with vaccines, ever give you baby vaccines. That was sort of the thing I got from it. And I'm like, okay, well, that's that. I'm like, it's sort of a bit sus that I'm not getting anything other than this is 100% perfect and nothing bad ever happens. And then this was the big one. So, and even today, if you Google, you know, Australian vaccinations, or similar, the second hit you get on Google, and this was the same back then, is a website which was then called AustralianVaccinationNetwork.org, which sounds very official. I now believe their name has had to have been changed a few times, and now it's something, I think it's something like AustralianVaccinationRisks.org. But back then it was just AVN, and they very much presented, this is just the Australian Vaccination Information Service, it was org. You know, .org, it makes it sound, you know, official, almost like it's a health service. And it was actually just run by some of the worst in the anti-vax world. There was nothing on there, really. It was the other extreme, from my perspective, from the health website. It was, here is everything bad that can happen. And not just can happen, this is what does happen. And here are all these terrifying statistics that I now know are just absolute nonsense is the most polite way of saying it. It was also around the time where Andrew Wakefield's Vaccines Cause cause Autism study had come out and had been debunked, but it wasn't quite at the point where he'd been turfed off the medical board. So there was that one. I wasn't as concerned about the autism one, which was from my memory is it was the MMR vaccine. And I did know in my research too, and again, this was all completely secret research because no one in my family knew. My son's dad absolutely didn't know I was researching this. None of my friends did. So this was just my little like secret project when I was pregnant. (laughs) And so I was like, okay, well, you know, you can do MMR separate. You could ask at the time, and I think you still can if you want. You could have got the measles separate to the mumps and rubella. It is something I see people do who are a bit hesitant I have looked into the science and it makes absolutely no difference. But, you know, sure, I have found generally then and now 
if you go to the medical profession with, I'm going to vaccinate, but I'm scared, I'm nervous, they pretty much fall over backwards to support you and do it with you or your kid, however you like, as long as you're going to do it. They're generally very supportive and the judgment sort of flies out the window. But yeah, so the AVN were a big part of my fear and they were just, here are these statistics. And a lot of it was pretty much brain damage was the majority. I remember this causes brain damage. 90% of, you know, reactions are not reported. Really similar to the stuff you sort of read today, really. It's the same crap. But to 21-year-old me who was in this bubble and, you know, again, it was before social media. It was before really vaccines were discussed like they are now. I was very susceptible to it. I sort of stopped paying attention in school and about age 12 or so, whether it's due to that. But I really didn't understand statistics at all and how they can be cherry-picked. And for me personally, that was a big part of my sort of slowly figuring things out and that, yeah, you can have this statistic and it can be true, but everyone that, like, drinks water ends up dying. Like, I mean, you know, you can pick anything. I was completely and utterly naive and very easily manipulated. And I sort of fell into that hole. And I wasn't 100% like these people are 100% right. I thought, well, this is one side and, you know, the medical is the other side. And I'm sort of stuck in between. But then on top of that, everyone around me is anti-vax. So that's where I'm going to go. From listener SN, did you also believe in other unsupported medical beliefs? And did changing your stance on vaccines change the other unsupported beliefs, i.e. chiropractic, essential oils, crystals, detoxing, non-GMO, or organic food? Hmm. Short answer, yes. But I can elaborate. No, 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 no. That, <laughs> no, no, that's actually good because I think we can cover some of SN's questions here with uh, a little list I put together. Okay. I've got a list here of quackery. Okay. And let's just hear your um, experiences with each one. Oh, my God. Okay. We'll yep. start with SN's list. I've got more to add to it, but we'll mm-hmm. go back to her list. Chiropractic. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. From as long as I can remember as a child, chiropractors and osteopaths. Not so long ago, I what I did still go and see a chiropractor in the last 10 years, but they weren't, it was more, they massaged like my jaw and they like did things that, similar I guess to a massage, but it was very much not the chiropractor who's like, if you get your back cracked, it'll cure your eczema or whatever. But yeah, no, that was a big part of my childhood, yes. Essential oils. Yes, that was one of the first things my mum trained in, was to be an aromatherapist, so yeah, they were a big part of absolutely my childhood and some of my early parenting. I mean, I still use lavender oil on the kids' pillows and it helps me go to sleep. I mean, you know, psychosomatic, but it smells good. But yeah, no, it, it's complete nonsense. But no, 100%, I thought they cured everything. Crystals. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> now, I it just those who don't know, I live in this house with this woman. There's a lot of crystals around this house and always has been. What's that about? So... <laughs> That the crystals thing was kind of my uh, that was kind of my thing that I went out on through I think friend groups and like boyfriends. So there was yeah there was a period in my late teens and early twenties where I could tell you the name of every crystal, which chakra it aligned with, and what you know how it was best meant to. Yeah, I, I believe that they. What did I believe? Like I believed, you know, if you, I can't eat, it's just like I've cut it from my memory. It's so traumatic and embarrassing. But no, you know, I believed that if you put, I think the bottom chakra is like solar plexus and it's like a dark sort of red. And, you know, if you're having like stomach pain, you could like put a crystal on that and like do Reiki on it or like do something and that that could help. Yeah. Nice. Uh, (laughs) Detoxing. Yeah. It wasn't so much called detoxing again throughout my childhood but I spent as from again as long as I can remember until I was a teenager and made my own money and started eating my whatever I wanted and haven't sort of stopped eating junk food but yeah and I was always on a very intensely restrictive diet to detox different sort of stuff so I don't even know what but that was again I was very sickly I, I you know I kept catching all these preventable transmissible diseases it just was weird I don't know why I kept getting all of them and I'd get sick for ages but you had a wall of crystals and herbs around you how did these diseases oh my get God. through 
I don't know. It was just a weird, it was just the weirdest thing. I was just really unlucky. Yeah. So we were on this constant search and I guess to the credit of my mum, she spent almost all of her time and money on taking me to various quacks, you know, to try different things. So yeah, I one of some of my uh, more traumatic childhood memories are going to school with my Ninja Turtles lunchbox and having white rice and peeled pears only in my lunchbox for what felt like years. I don't know how long it was. And then every, if I did get invited to a birthday party, which, you know, I didn't get invited to a lot, I would bring my own snacks because I wouldn't be allowed cake and I wouldn't be allowed to drink anything they had. And back in the 80s, no one drank water. It was just like cordial and whatever, which I didn't even know what that tasted like. I remember eating jam for the first time, like in my teens, I think, being like, woo! Yeah, so detoxing, I guess, is covered by that. It was I was always on restrictive, different restrictive food diets. In this bubble of yours, um, it wouldn't have been such a big thing in the 80s and 90s, but what about non-GMO or organic food? Did that come up in this world? I don't so much remember that. I do know it was very mu- it was more like colouring additives, food colouring additives and like emulsifiers. So, so again... My mum, she like baked and made just about everything I ate from scratch. And if we did go and get something from the supermarket, we'd, I'd always be read, we'd be reading. I just know I have this memory of back in the day, like we, I, I couldn't have bread because bread had like sugar and like food, co- not, maybe not food coloring. I don't know. Did bread have all the stuff added to it back then? Maybe not. So it was more that. I don't remember so much the organic No, it's, GMOs. that's a 20, I mean, it was always around, but it's the like 21st Like late 90s, early noughties yeah. more, yeah. All right, here we go. Here we're on to my list now. Oh, my gosh, yep. And, you know, I do have some background knowledge. <laughs> this is, oh this my is God, a bit it's un- gonna get embarrassing. This is a bit unfair of me, but anyway. What's your experience with acupuncture? Hmm, yes. Look, again, it feels nice to have acupuncture. Okay, well, maybe it doesn't feel nice at the time, but you feel nice afterwards. It gives you, like, this weird buzz, which I have, again, I, I, have a, I understand why now, because it. I think it gets your adrenaline and your cortisol going or something because like you've been pricked with needles but yes I did and I again as a as an you know adult I say in inverted commas because yeah I was I moved out at 17 and so from that age onwards I would pay a lot of money to go and get acupuncture to treat my terrible health issues you know I just I kept getting (laughs) these illnesses and then when I'd get sick with a cough that turned into bronchitis that turned into pneumonia and I just kept treating it with herbs and I just would be sick for like two months it's really weird so and then I'd go and like get acupuncture and stuff so yeah I did it it feels nice but it didn't help with the pneumonia no which is weird I think you saw the wrong guy it was mostly a lady actually okay yeah well there you go that's the problem I needed a ladies can't do acupuncture everyone knows that (laughs) no I did no I have gone no I have seen a I've seen quite a few and what kind of money are we talking about you know, at least $80 a session, which again, for me, particularly back in the day, it's a lot of money. That would be just for the acupuncture, like a short session. And then you've got to pay for the herbs, which are $50, $60, maybe for one or two bottles of, it depends what you get. Because then I had Western Chinese, uh, sorry, I had Western herbal medicine. And then there's Chinese, traditional Chinese medicine. And so sometimes I'd be doing both. So it's a lot of money. It's money everywhere. And what about like through pregnancy? Were you trying acupuncture then? No, I think I was pretty, in pregnancy, I was like, I just, I'm not going to do anything. Like in the good way as well, like I didn't drink coffee and leading up to my pregnancy, I was in very unhealthy land of smoking and drinking and whatever. So yeah, no, I just didn't do anything. I do believe acupuncture was on the cards for, I was considering it because I went over the due date and I think that's one of the things I did I think even the midwife suggested it like that's one of the things that can induce labor but no I don't remember doing I didn't touch any anything at all in pregnancy what about after having the baby any more acupuncture for you or spawn one? Oh, oh my god you're unlocking this trauma from me I know because I already know about it that's what I might say do you yeah have I forgotten maybe acupuncture yeah yeah I remember in my when my son was, you know, six months old or so and he wasn't sleeping because babies don't. Yeah, again, I remember going up to Katoomba in the Blue Mountains, which was at the time. It's Newtown 2.0. Yeah, but it was like a two-hour drive. And, yeah, what did they do exactly? It was a lot of money. 
I'm trying to remember. I think that there was some acupuncture, but it wasn't so they didn't do needles. It was more just like they would gently like touch like his little chubby baby arms. And it certainly didn't hurt him. Like it was very, it was so much. I remember thinking, wow, like it almost looks like they're not doing anything at all. And then there were suggestions of what I should have done differently, generally, of how I should have improved myself. Yeah, I do remember that. Feng Shui. Oh, my God. You know, this is bad. I know, I have inside information. But what I'm trying to do for the audience's point of view is that I'm trying to build like a holistic idea. Of how insane I was? (laughs) No, not just you. (laughs) But I just, you know, I think it's important. I no, think, I know, I yeah. Think something that came up in my research is that a, a really big part of anti-vax and science denial in general is a complete and utter lack of science education. Like, yes. And it's not that they haven't been educated. This is the thing. People say science education and they go, oh, they never got taught it. No, no, they got taught it. They simply closed their minds to it and refused to hear any of it. Like, they all went to the same schools we went to. Mm. They all sat in the same classes we sat in. They just had a different experience in that classroom. Yeah, I I really don't remember learning anything, any science in high school at all. I'm sure I went, like, I had science classes. I remember a creepy teacher and some creepy comments he made to me in high school, a science teacher, but I really, I remember, I don't remember learning anything. I remember, like, Bunsen burners yeah, I don't remember learning anything. So yeah, but um, yes, Feng Shui. Um, yeah, I did. I dally. I did a little dip my toe in that again when my oh god, when my son was like a month or so old, and oh god, this is so embarrassing. And yeah, he was like crying because you know babies do that. Now I'm you know old and have three kids. It's you know that's what babies do. They cry a lot. It's okay. It doesn't mean that anything's wrong. It doesn't mean there's maybe an evil spirit in the room. Or you haven't smudge dicked enough to get rid of the evil spirits. Or that maybe the because the cot was facing the bedroom door and that's bad feng shui. And if you move things around. Um, yeah, so I, I dabbled. It didn't, you know, it didn't help. He still cried at night. Yeah. That's amazing. Iridology? Oh, yeah. Yes, again, mum trained in that. So I don't per- I don't remember the person. Oh, I mean, yeah, a little bit. I, d- I did get into a habit of like looking in people's eyes and... You know, I think it was like, you know, yeah, if you had like a, you know, some people say, I've got like, because I've got greeny, hazily eyes, so I've got little blotches of different color, and that's an iridology that's like bad. So if you've got like a darker or lighter patch that lines up somewhere on a chart to some part of you, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, yes. Homeopathy. Oh, yeah. My favorite of all the quackeries, because they literally tell you, like they don't even lie, we're just giving you water. Yes, So absolutely, again, homeopathy was a big part of the medical treatment I received as a kid, teenager, and early adult. What is interesting aspect about it, again, as a parent myself, so didn't vaccinate, still had these underlying concerns that I was doing the wrong thing and constantly, just not just in this aspect, but just generally in all aspects of parenting, I think like many new parents do you're like oh my god I've got this whole life and blah blah blah. so I (laughs) and so then I became a single mother just after his first birthday so so young so I was a single mum wasn't working living on you know welfare living alone didn't have a lot of support decided I'm like I can't deal with this fear like I'm so worried that I'm doing the wrong thing I'm gonna go and get homeopathic prophylaxis which is, in case you didn't know, that's when you go and see a homeopath who charges you, you as single mother in 2005, $380 just for the first session, just to meet with you. And then he gives you these little bottles of watery alcohol that have, they're exactly the same as a vaccine because vaccines just have the essence of the disease in them and that's how it works. But these just have the essence of the... They have the memory. They have water that remembers the vaccine. Yep. Something. Or the disease. But then there were flowers involved in it. Yeah, because there's flowers that... I mean, there are some flowers out there that COVID has not affected. So those flowers obviously are immune. That's how it works. Absolutely. So if you grab a jar of water, walk it past those flowers, the water looks at the flowers, remembers them... Mm Mm-hmm diagnoses what their um, immunity to the various diseases are 
and keeps it in its stored memory as the H2O water molecule is perfect for doing. So I took an older, confident white man to tell me that this is fine. <clears throat> anyway, so yeah, I went um, through, I think about four or five sessions seeing this homeopathic doctor, I think he called himself, in a Balmain in Sydney. And I had to pay off because I just didn't have the money. It was so much money. I just remember for me, it was so much money. And he knew my situation. And that's one something I look back on. And I remember being in tears, not about, but just because I was so overwhelmed and worried. Like I was just like, am I doing the right thing? Like I'm so scared to vaccinate because of all these horrible things that can happen. But I'm so scared that if I don't vaccinate, all these horrible things can happen. Like I was just, I just want to do what's best for my baby. And he was like, oh, honey, don't you worry. You just come and see me and hand over your welfare check. And if you don't get to eat, that's okay. I look, that's one I look back on and I'm just like, you mother. Um, yeah. So I did that. It did make me feel a bit better in that I'm like, I've done everything I can, you know, vaccination wise, that isn't vaccination, but I'm doing what I can. Yeah. Mm. Reiki. Tell us your personal experiences with Reiki. Oh gosh. Okay. So, so mm, (laughs) Reiki is a, I guess it's like an energy healing thing. This is my perspective of it is that at some point my mum didn't have, she didn't have Reiki. And then at some point she had Reiki. She went away for a weekend. She came back, she had Reiki. So when she would put her hands on me, like on my shoulders or whatever, and after a while, if you do that, you know, heat comes out and that heat is actually healing energy. When I was ooh, ugh, 11, I think we just moved to Sydney. I think this was a birthday present. I was sent off with my grandma at the time who came over from New Zealand for this special event. And we went off to do a Reiki workshop where, you know, you start the weekend without Reiki. And then by the end of the workshop, you have Reiki level one. I don't remember heaps about it except the actual sort of part at the end where you get the Reiki. There was some sort of talking and they put their hands over your head and you have to imagine like a sunflower like opening over the top of your chakra and then you have it. So that was Reiki level one. And then as a young, you know, like around 18, again, this was my bubble. So, you know, my boyfriend and my friends and we got this shaman Oh my God. So we got this white man who was actually somehow also a Native American shaman who came to our apartment in Bondi for the weekend, cost a lot of money. And he spent the weekend and he gave us Reiki too. And there was some symbols involved and there was drumming and there was every time like a door would creak or a noise was made, he would talk to the spirits. And even at this point, I was like, I'm going along with it, but even on inside, I was like, maybe this guy, <laughs> I mean, there's a chance this guy's maybe full of shit, but you know, I still, I didn't say anything. Yeah. So that was Reiki. And then I really believed it because, you know, if you put your hands like on one spot, two hands on your body, partic- even if it's a part that's feeling tense or sore and you like relax and you breathe into it, they do start to warm up. And after a while, you do feel a a warmth or a placebo sort of effect. And, you know, as I've said, when I was having this conversation with you, Jude, I think a while ago, like I think for some people that idea of healing touch that isn't, I mean, you're looking at your face, it sounds creepy. (laughs) But look, again, I just, I don't want to diss on everybody who believes in all of this. I mean. No, that's my job. Yeah. And just just for the record, I do diss on everybody (laughs) who believes this stuff. All right, continue. Look, I do and I don't. Like I don't. To be clear, I don't believe in any of this whatsoever and haven't for quite a long time and have a kind of very black and white opinion about it. However, it's which is kind of a contradiction, yet I also fully understand what it's like to be in that and why people believe it and where it can be beneficial. And the placebo effect is not to be poo-pooed. The placebo effect is actually statistically quite high in all sorts of things. So if it's something that isn't harming people and it's helping them, why not? The problem is, is just about every single thing we've discussed so far does harm people at least financially, if nothing else, Mm. because it is extortionate. You'd be better off downloading placebo on Spotify. You really would because they are an awesome band. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You might as well just do that 
and then you're getting the placebo effect and some awesome tunes. I think they actually would be better. Yeah. Yeah, I love placebo. I've got to add them to my Spotify <laughs> list. Thank you. <laughs> uh, reflexology. Mm, yes, very much. It was done on me. So if I had a sore shoulder, then mum would massage a part of my foot to help it. I guess that was it in a nutshell. Mm. Uh, I didn't practice it myself, but... Definitely experienced it. Yeah. Okay, moving on to our next section here. I was just going to say, before you move on... Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. A couple of the things that you missed out... Okay, yeah. ...in that list yeah. of Hell craziness. Yeah. So Hell yeah, hit me up. I can't believe there's more crazy I forgot about. Oh, there's so much more. But this is just some quick things that I sort of remembered. Kinesiology is a big one, which I didn't ever fully understand. Still don't fully understand. But yeah, that was a big part of... That's when you hold things in one hand... And then they test how strong you are. The kinetic energy. Yeah. Or and potential kinetic energy if you're holding it. There's a lot of tapping. Yeah, I remember tapping. So, yeah, again, that was definitely a whole thing. And, again, when I was a young mother, I did around the similar time where I was having money ripped out of be my every freaking charlatan. I went to kinesiologists. I still don't fully – I never fully understood what they did, but that was one. And then I don't know if this is sort of a, a different road, but then there was dream interpretation – Aura reading. I, I didn't know about that stuff. I just left that and the tarot card reading. Oh, I was a palm and tarot reader as well. Yeah. All of that stuff, yeah. yeah. I just felt there wasn't a lot of health aspect to that. Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> because you can read somebody's oh, health I, situation sure you can. from their aura. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. But I think we've got a general picture here. Every type of witchcraft ever invented, you were into. Yeah, well, it was done to me and it was very much 1,000% my world and I was very close to my mom sort of me and her a lot and I just didn't even think to not believe most of it yeah pretty much everything and there would be a longer list if I sat and really thought about it there was also the fun time or maybe I shouldn't tell that story no come on you've started it now what time I told you about it before before we started and you were like oh my god tell that in the podcast and I was like oh my god that's really embarrassing well then you already know my answer go on oh okay yeah, so I was about six and I don't remember why, but I think it was because I was sick with one of these preventable transmissible diseases. Again, weird. I was given, I had to pee into a cup and I had to drink my own pee, my own urine. Don't try this at home. That's right, people. A six-year-old was made to drink their own urine. It might have been seven. Oh, well, that's all right then. <laughs> I thought, I, you said six. I was like, God damn it. <laughs> But on a seven, oh, everyone's drinking pee from seven onwards. I couldn't finish it. Really? And do you know what happened? I vomited. No. Mm, I don't remember. But that was, again, my mum was truly getting this information from someone or somewhere that she respected and really was trying to do these things to help me. I don't think she was just a sort of, you know, total whatever. But yeah. That was a particularly scarring memory that just came to me earlier. I'd forgotten about for about 20 years. So, so yeah, pretty much everything, like you said. And even things you can't imagine, so many things you can't imagine that are in that bubble. To answer, I think, the question of just like, yeah, does it extend to other areas being anti-vax? Uh, yes. And like things you've never even heard of and you don't want to hear about. <laughs> We'll have to get our kids to drink pee. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> All right, so... Moving on to the next section here. This is by far the most, uh, out of 400 or so responses we got, I think this question made up 300 of them. And uh, so I've tried to find the one that was the most concise. Before I ask the next question, we got bills to pay. Let's go, boy! I'm going to take a short break from the show right now to talk about my sponsors and Patreon. I don't currently have sponsors or Patreon. But if you'd like to support the show, you can do that by buying my novel. It's called Chaos Machine by Judas Falling. It's available through Amazon. You don't need a Kindle to read it. Almost any digital device will do. Don't forget, Chaos Machine by Judas Falling. Now, back to the show. From listener KP, what made you change your mind and vaccinate? What would you say to an anti-vaxxer or vaccine-hesitant individual to help ease their minds? Yeah, I think that's, you know, the million dollar question that it, if I ever bring this up with people or if I get involved with these discussions online. And, you know, I, I wish I could say it was just this one thing, but I guess, which is probably likely for a lot of people, 
I guess it was a lot of just different little things over time. And, you know, again, my experience was different and that I was born into it. The internet was around and things were around, but it's still, it was a little, it, there wasn't social media. It was different to it is now. I think from when my son was 12 months old and I became single mum, and then when he was two and a half is when I took him to have his first vaccination. So that's the a year and a half, I guess, is the process. I mean, I was lo- looking into it from when I was pregnant, but that's when I really started to be like I was, you know, it was just me, I was sort of alone in charge of this kid. And that's when I guess I really had the space, I think, as well to sort of look into it. So there were a few things. One was the, the social, so I was sort of looking for a mum group. I was looking for like a social group. And I found this group of attachment parenting group, which was an online Yahoo group at the time, but they met up. Not to be confused with attachment theory, which is a science-based and evidence-based, you know, this was attachment parenting, this belief from pediatrician Dr. Sears that, you know, you must breastfeed your baby and you must never put your baby down. Like they physically need to touch you and it's all sort of, it's in that world, right? So I found this group. We met up a couple of times, probably three or four times. All of the mums in that group were 100% anti-vax and talked about it a lot. I have since discovered, this is the thing I said to you today, like, oh, I figured something out. The head of the Australian Vaccination Network I was speaking of before that were actually secretly very much anti-vax was, oh my God, I think I've forgotten her name, Meryl Dory or something. Anyway, she, I looked at her photo and I was like, oh my God, she was a massive person in the online part of this group. But I didn't know that's who she was. But again, I'm 21, 22, like never, like I'd never even held a baby before I had my son. Completely in love with him, love being a parent, but very much naive and so, you know, open. And so I was getting this information online. Then I met up with these ladies who were, that. this did not include Meryl. She lived further away, but she was very much part of the online group. They were lovely. They talked a lot. They were older than me, like most parents were, a lot about not vaccinating. But then (laughs) pretty much by the end of the third, like, group meetup, I was like, I cannot, these are not my people. Like, I cannot. They were just, the baby, like, these were little babies and they'd spit out a dummy and another baby would pick it up and suck on it and then one would shove it in the rubbish bin and put it in another baby's mouth. They'd be like, oh, germs, it's great. And there were just these things. There was nothing evil about them, but it just reached this point with them and a few other interactions I'd had with, it's one thing to be anti-vax when you were vaccinated as a kid You don't have children and you haven't had to think about it. But you'd be like, oh, I would never vaccinate my child because you're in this little bubble. It's very different to have a kid and see this little vulnerable thing and be like, oh, my God, this is actually a really important decision. And I just like that. And I started to look in online to some of the sort of big anti-vax names and other things they'd said and done. And they were disgusting, horrible people, like just horrendous they they went on to you know harass horribly like parents who'd lost their little babies from whooping cough and just some of the absolute scum of the earth and yet doctors I interacted with midwives or nurses and things for checkups you know yes there was that judgment you know when I had my son at the hospital which is understandable but I just got to this point like they don't have an they don't have a foot in the game like they're advising me what they truly believe to be best for my child. They are not getting some kickback. I never fully got into the whole, they're somehow being made, paid by the pharmaceutical companies for, you know, vaccinating kids. And for me, it was just more like, I got to know more of these people in real life, what it's really like to live this anti-vax world. I'm like, this is not my thing. Like, I am not, I don't know a lot and I'm not good at science. But what this is happening with these babes, this is gross. I'm not okay with this. <laughs> but you drank your own pee. I didn't what are you want worried? to. What are you worried about a dummy in a bin? Come on, man. I didn't <laughs> want to drink it. It was horrible. We brought all this trauma up for me. Um, and then I just, yeah, I just spoke to, you know, just doctors over time that were quite patient with me. And I just sort of got to this point of seeing that, you could see this frustration in them and they were trying. And I think then around this time, I met this really hot guy. And oh, yeah. Tell me more. 
Oh, well, yeah. And we started, well, we'd been friends for a while and I finally sort of convinced him that he should like go out with me, this single mum who drank her own urine. <laughs> <laughs> if I had known that. <laughs> and... Yeah, what do you remember? Because I do remember at some point it came up or, you know, I was very much in the realm of thinking about it and researching it, but there was many other things happening in life. It would have come up over in conversation at some point. Oh, it certainly did. What do you remember? I remember, like, probably, like, the faces I've given you tonight on many things. I was, you know, like, and I do actually remember a couple of times feeling as a, as a, a, as the new beau, as the new boyfriend, I... I overstepped my boundaries a few times in the conversations. But, you know, when I met you, you were this, like, this hippie chick um, from Newtown who dressed and looked like a hippie chick from Newtown. So it wasn't unexpected, but I do remember letting you know how I felt about the vaccination things. And I do remember feeling a couple of times I was like, oh, I shouldn't have said that much, because then we'd talk about this is your son. Yes, yep. I definitely felt a couple of times I overstepped my boundaries there and when I let my opinion be known. Because, you know, I'm not backwards and coming forward. That's... No, it's like, I don't remember asking your opinion. I mean, I probably no. did. But... <laughs> no, you wouldn't have had to. As no. soon as I heard that you weren't vaccinated and your kid wasn't going to be vaccinated, I would let you know what I thought about it. But anyway, what's done is done. I have no regrets. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do remember you generally being very, very cautious and very respectful that you weren't coming into being like, right, I'm the new dad. And you stayed out of, even if I'd ask you things, you were very careful with many things. Even if you had an opinion about whatever was happening, you know, with him at the time, you just sort of stayed out of it. But I do remember, I do remember you very much having an when opinion. When it comes to science, science is science, man. Like, we're beyond opinions. I do remember that. And at that point, I'd just about, I don't remember when it came up, you know, when we were dating, but... I was at the point where four hours ago at the beginning of this conversation, (laughs) I was told I wasn't vaccinated because I had an allergic reaction. Now, in my life, which you know and you have seen, I have had anaphylactic reactions to medications, some antibiotics, not all of them. Most antibiotics are great. Some other just random. I just have weird. I have a really terrible immune system. It's probably because I wasn't vaccinated, but that's a whole other story. So at that point, I was kind of like, all right, we, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. We go, I'm going to do the vaccination. I'm not going to tell anyone. But now I'm scared he's going to have an allergic reaction. So that's sort of where my headspace was around the time, I think, that I talked to you about it. And so what I ended up doing is, again, like I sort of said earlier, if you even speak to a doctor or a pediatrician or whoever it is, even if it's I'm not ready to vaccinate yet, but I'm considering it. Well, these are my fears. And I can't say this for every doctor because as someone who's been sick a lot, some doctors are just the worst. And that's the nicest way I can put it. But if you can find a nurse, a just any sort of trained <laughs> medical health professional in any, even if they're not your doctor, but someone you have some respect for, you have some faith in, and many that even if you say, like, I'm op- I'm starting to think about it, if you're coming from an anti-vax or you're coming from a hesitant position or here are my concerns and here are my fears and here's this information I've heard and here are the statistics I've heard. My experience anyway was that many, most will be, if anything, bend over backwards to support you, even if it takes you six months, even if you want to vaccinate your child slowly or they want you know they might tell you the risks in that because they are not following the schedule but anything is better than nothing and I think I and on my uh, personal Facebook I think I know a lot of the people that responded were the first people the first like four people that responded are all people I know that work in the health field doctors and nurses and their first things with just the same thing just like how can I speak to vaccine hesitant and anti-vax patients because jokes aside about it I really feel for people I feel for that doctor when I was in the delivery room nearly 18 years ago telling them no I'm not gonna even vitamin k he's gonna heal his you know hole in his lung by like spiritual thinking and crystals I feel for them and some of them are gonna lose their shit and just yell at you that's obviously understandable not gonna help anybody but if you can just keep an open even, you know, I remember a, a good friend of both of ours who's a nurse. This is a not exactly vaccine, but she talked about how 
She worked as an MS nurse and had a patient who was worried about taking the medication and I think was doing I can't, it was some woo thing or something like aromatherapy as well. She was just doing that and this patient was getting sicker and our friend the nurse sort of convinced her like, okay, you can do both. And I remember saying that the patient was sort of like, oh, but won't that be too much? You know, we'll have the medication and the power of essential oils. But just, you know, that friend of ours, she's incredibly patient. And I can just see, as I know many, many health workers are dealing with people. And I cannot even begin to imagine how hard it's been through COVID. But the answer, yeah, for health professionals or for just people in general, if you truly want to be able to connect with people who are hesitant or anti-vax, some people are just not going to be in the realm. You can quote statistics and send them scientific links till the cows come home, which is what I see 90% of the things that are done online. And I get it. I've done that myself with things, but that wouldn't have helped me. I didn't trust that world. That world was the alien and enemy to me. So the best thing you can do is just have an open door when you're interacting with these patients not make them feel judged. I know it's hard. You can go home and bitch about it and all the things, but just let them know, even if you don't agree with them, but just that they don't feel humiliated and then they will start to open up to you. And that is, it's just that trust and that relationship. Yeah, that wasn't necessarily my experience. I had that a bit for me. Honestly, it was more the reverse. Once I really got amongst that community and read up more on who are the people that tell me that, vaccine cause autism. Oh, this guy is the worst person. These are why he would say that. So for me, it wasn't so much statistics or even kindly health professionals, although that was a part of it. But I think today that is 100% the best way. And I know it's very difficult, but it's a slow process. I think arguing with someone online, unfortunately, I don't think there's a golden ticket and meme you can send them. But other than I truly believe from the parent perspective, I truly believe most parents who don't vaccinate their kids or are hesitant are terrified. They might be injecting poison into their baby. So if you really think about it from that perspective, that if you really want to make a difference, some of them are just like nut jobs or just whatever. But the majority of people just want to do the best thing for their kid, like 90% of parents out there, even the ones that make bad decisions. They want to do the right thing. They think they're doing what's best. They don't know what they don't know, the Dunning-Kruger. Like, you don't know that you don't know so much. So it's just treating it from that perspective. They truly are doing what they think is best. And if you just call them all the names and call them an idiot, you're only pushing them further away. I get it. Like, again, I'm guilty of some of this myself as well. And in COVID, it's been especially difficult. And as myself, as someone who has a lot of health issues and is immune compromised and has been in the high vulnerability risk category for COVID. It's very, very difficult to sit and watch people go, oh, I'm not going to get the vaccine. And there's so much privilege and all of those things. But if you truly want to make a difference, I think that's the only way is treat people that they truly believe they are doing the right thing and they're scared. They're just scared. They've been told all sorts of nonsense and terrifying statistics. So you've got to start from that perspective. Well said, and I agree with everything you say, but I personally will continue to poke the finger of shame at them. <laughs> uh, I'm not trying to change their mind. I just want them to know that I don't think they're very brat. Uh, <laughs> all right, well, well, I don't think it has to do with intelligence necessarily. No, no, it doesn't. There's, there's a, like truly, it's there's, a... There's a, you know, there's a difference between ignorance and um, unintelligence. They're different things. Yes. You can be very smart and completely ignorant. And that is what you're dealing with. And 100%, I think, got to add then privilege is a, you know. Oh, it's all privilege. That's a whole other conversation. The whole but thing is it's privilege. It's another one. Of, that's a, completely. It's, I mean, you know, I researched on the uh, previous episode, A Pox to You. You should check it out after this one. It's really good. The most common denominator in this whole anti-vax thing is people who have no experience mm-hmm. of the, like, I grew up like, you know, I'm older than you, so... I grew up in a time in New Zealand as well. You know, I went to school with kids who had polio. Yeah. Like, See, I know? just miss that. I just miss that. And I think that's another part of it. I didn't really see people having those yeah, and, effects. And, and I knew kids who had had, um, whose mums had had rubella or they were born with rubella or had rubella during pregnancy. And I've seen, I've seen the results of that. Mm. 
you know, I just grew up in a time when we had a different attitude to disease because we had cured so many of these things. And yeah. why would you st- go backwards? You just wouldn't. You wouldn't. No. But when you grow up without any of that around you, you've never seen it. You've never seen a baby with whooping cough. Mm-hmm. And someone says to you, oh, whooping cough's terrible. You go, is it? Because I've never seen it. That's privilege, man. Oh, that yeah. That is privilege. A hundred percent. From listener CP, I'm curious about your relationships with anti-vax friends, assuming you have some from your anti-vax days. I'm struggling with how to continue being friends with some adults that won't get vaccinated for COVID. The current plan is to not be friends, but I will of course be polite when we cross paths. Like it's not just getting out of the bubble. I mean, unless you like leave a cult. As a general rule, you don't get out of any bubbles. You're still completely attached to that bubble. You might not be inside it, but it's got its sticky goo all over you. You've still got people in there. Gross. Yeah. I guess for me, I didn't tell really anybody when I started the vaccination process with my son. And over time, I'm not, you know, for a variety of reasons unrelated to any of this, I'm not sort of in touch with my family or any sort of real friends from that time. But... You know, I am still the weird hippie girl at heart. So, yeah, I still have friends and people and I meet or acquaintances that are anti-vax or have beliefs that I don't in this world. I guess ultimately for me, I guess it comes down to the person a lot of the time. You know, there's people I've met in the last couple of years Then it's only since I've, you know, since COVID's been a thing and I've only really got to know them. And as I've got to know them, sort of they're anti-vax I just, yeah, I don't know. I, for me, I guess it's more of a case-by-case basis. You know, I, I'm also, you know, a sort of staunch atheist and have many, um, which is weird, being Mrs. Satan is my superhero, and have many, many, you know, opinions about religion. And But I have friends who are various religions. I don't know. I think in COVID time, things are sort of, I don't know, in Australia right now, I'm feeling like, again, a, sort of a bit safer and like things are a bit more reasonable. But I don't know, last year, I didn't, there's most of my friends and people we know, like we haven't seen and I didn't see for 12 months. The kids didn't see them, particularly people who weren't vaccinating. We just, if there were classes or there were events and things on and I knew that at least one of the people that went or there was a group of people that weren't vaccinating, then we just didn't go. And that was hard and that was hard on the kids. But we have the privilege of knowing this won't last forever. This is a pandemic. We have vaccines. We can get vaccinated. We got boosters and we live in Australia. We don't have well, who knows? Right now we don't have polio sort of lurking at the corner. I think that's difficult. I th- honestly, I think it's a case-by-case basis. I do have other friends. That's I do have some friends, actually. I do have one good friend from my early days who was also used to be sort of an anti-vaxxer, and she now has got her own kids and is absolutely pro-science. She has a lot of friends. In fact, most of them are anti-vax and still into a lot of that woo. I just, I guess it just comes down to are they kind of a bit of an arsehole and you don't really want them in your life anyway, then this is a good excuse to get rid of them. And if really they're just someone who's got maybe their reasons and maybe you have some empathy for why they're easily influenced or easily taken advantage of and you can see why they've fallen down this hole even though you don't agree with them. I don't know. I don't think that's an easy black or white answer. But also I get it. It is hard. I was happy to cut out a lot of those people around that time for various reasons, not just them like dipping their babies like pacifiers and gross stuff and letting them eat bird poo, like four month olds, like licking bird poo. I'm all for like, don't go crazy with the hygiene, but stuff that was like, just dude, this is too much. I was happy to never see them again. From listener KJ, did you get sick a lot as a child? Did you get any of the severe diseases that would have been covered by childhood immunization? You've said you got sick a lot, but let's run through all of, especially the vaccine preventable diseases that you did get. Measles, mumps, chickenpox, German measles or rubella. I was diagnosed with chickenpox at least twice and measles three times. Now, some of those are stories I've been told and I don't remember. So did I see a doctor? Question mark. Was it a naturopath diagnosing me? I don't know, but I know for sure because then... As an adult, I had to get blood tests, you know, to see what antibodies I had. And I 100% had all of those. Rotavirus, yeah, they're all the ones that I can think of. And as an adult, I have been, I started my vaccination process as an adult for myself. There was, so I've had the whooping cough vaccination and I'm looking at you like you would remember. I mean, the COVID vaccination. There was a couple, but most of the vaccinations I was eligible for, 
I'd already had those diseases and had those immunities. So yes, I 100% got all of them. Yes. As we've touched on already, you do have a very compromised immune system. Yeah. With uh, You would suffer from what anyone would describe as chronic illness. Yes, absolutely. And I have uh, been told by two different immunologists, I have a litany of health issues that I won't bore you all with, but I have been told by two different immunologists that not being vaccinated as a child um, does negatively you know, impact your immune system. I'm sure there could be other reasons too. Well, if you get all of those, I mean, there's a reason we immunize against those diseases you just mentioned. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So if you get them all, which you got the whole lot of them, it's going to damage you permanently. Even just your average diseases or like infections you'd get that you'd take, you'd put an antibiotic cream on or you'd do, there's just all these things. I didn't do that. So any little illness or scratch or whatever I'd get would last for ages and may, I'd be sick for weeks and months. Yeah. From listener RO. Do you hold any resentment towards your parents for leaving you vulnerable to vaccine-preventable diseases during your childhood now that you realise how dangerous that was? I know some people sort of don't vaccinate because it's easier, you know, and there's a laziness and there's a bit like, you know, looking back, you know, my mum particularly, she was ill-informed at best. She probably knew better, to be honest, but she did spend all of her time and a lot of money taking me to all these woo doctors and trying all these different things to try and help with my health. So it's not like she did nothing. Yeah, so no, I don't, I'm not resentful towards that. From listener SJ, I'd like to know, why is it important to us to feel the need to change each other's minds? Do we need to agree on it on what's best for each other? We make health choices regarding ourselves, our families and our kids every single day. Why does choosing to vaccinate or not become anyone else's business or opinion? I think I'll cover this one. It's called public health and you live in a society. Any <laughs> thoughts to add to that? Yeah, I, I, um, I 100% agree. For example, when four-year-old me got a chest infection that my parents chose to not treat with, say, antibiotics, and then that dragged on and it affected my immune system. And yes, there is an there is a flow on effect that it will eventually affect other people and that maybe I will take up space in a hospital ward when I wouldn't have needed to. And then I've seen a lot of people comparing, well, you can't punish people who don't vaccinate because then you'd punish people who smoke if they got lung cancer and all these sort of things. But yeah, I think that's separate to a transmittable disease that you can just literally walk past somebody and as we know, like from what we've seen with COVID, it can kill people indiscriminately. There's people like me who I'm on immune suppressant medication. I have a, we have a friends who've been on chemotherapy for a long time who have young kids. Their immune system is suppressed. I just like, it just makes me furious to think I can't imagine, if, you know, there's pregnant women, there's elderly people, there's little kids and I truly, even again, looking at anti-vaxxers and people be like, oh, they don't care if they kill somebody. I think they do. I think they, if they really sat and thought about it, went, what if I walked past somebody and coughed and because I wasn't vaccinated, that killed that person or made them terribly sick and on a ventilator. I think if that connection was truly made, I think most people would care about that. But I think it is easy to just be think, oh, it's just a conspiracy or... Or whatever, but yeah. In summary, no. I think this is a completely different vaccinations in general to transmissible diseases is a different conversation, and then you throw in a pandemic, and we're talking about something even more urgent. And everyone just needs to kind of shut the fuck up. A common thing that came up, and you've sort of just touched on it there a little bit. So many anti-vaxxers will use the quote, "Well, I have an immune system." <sighs> Now, I mean, that mm -hmm. is just, as I said in the uh, A Pox to You episode, that is just someone saying, I don't understand the science. Yep. They do not put a chemical in you that fights the disease for you. That is not what a vaccine is. It's not like other medications. It's not, it just doesn't do that. It is your immune system. One of the very common things, and this goes right back to back in the, the original anti-vax rhetoric from the 18th and 19th century, was diet and exercise. Mm -hmm. That will save you from all diseases. And now as someone who's had a lifetime of 
chronic illness, really. How do you feel about that privilege that these healthy people who have lived healthy their whole lives and they really honestly in their heart of hearts, deep down in their soul, they believe it's because I'm such a good person yeah. that I don't get diseases. I'm doing everything right and always have done. It makes me cry sometimes. Like it just, it's, I wish this is, uh, yeah, just coming from someone who's chronically ill and it's chronic pain and I get it. And in many different ways, I guess it's that confirmation bias or you know even as a parent like having when you know I have one child he didn't really you know yeah he cried a lot as a baby and stuff he didn't really have tantrums and I'd be like I am just doing it right this is clearly whatever I am doing any kid people out there with baby having you know kid having a tantrum and you'd be like oh and you'd be secretly just being like they just need to do you know whatever it was I was doing you know they needed to I don't even know what I thought I did. And then, you know, you have your second child or your third child and, you know, they're completely different. I think we all have that experience and different things where you're like, oh, my God, I know nothing. And I feel like the older I've got, the more I've realized I know nothing. I know less and less. I'm more and more aware of how little I know. And I I just, yeah, it, it makes me emotional, the diet and exercise thing when it comes to chronic health or people you know, even talking with chronic mental health as well, just, oh, you're depressed and, you know, you should try yoga and, like, if you just go out in the sun sometimes and, like, you just need to eat more kale and you have good, these green smoothies and just, like, first of all, do you really think anyone who's suffered with these things has not tried that and even drinking their own urine, for God's sake? We've tried everything. Okay, I haven't tried that again since I was a child, but you try it all. And doctor, this is not... Things like diet and exercise, it's not like doctors and the even immunologists are like, just have the vaccine, you know, just take this medicine and do nothing else. That's the first thing doctors general and scientists will say. This can work, but you also should exercise and eat a good diet and go out in the sun and blah, 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 blah. And yeah, it can help. But I think a lot of the people that have been generally just healthy their whole life and maybe they live a healthy lifestyle, to be honest, they could probably just sit down eat pizza four times a day and smoke a pack a day, and they'd probably be 99% as healthy as they are. God damn it. It's so unfair. From listener K, a serious question. Did you realize that you were relying on everyone else getting their kids vaxxed to protect your child from preventable diseases via herd immunity? Now, I do know that you do realize that now, obviously. Yeah. But it is an important question. I think this goes back to the privilege. They just haven't seen it. They're unaware of these diseases. And... Their answer to everything is like, well, you know, you don't need a vaccine. You just need to go down to the local cafe, get one of those green smoothies you were just talking about. Yeah. Do your yoga. Talk to your therapist. Pull out some tarot cards. Do some chakras. <coughs> have yeah. a surf on the beach. Mm -hmm. Go home. And um, you're all good. You'll and never you know, get sick with anything. The privilege is that a large percentage of those people and their families will go through life. Really will work out just fine for them because everyone else is vaccinating. And without any other serious health issues. And they can go to their grave thinking it was all of those things. But yeah, herd immunity, did I ever think about that? No, I think my, my limited medical scientific understanding of vaccines up until, you know, 2006, which is when I got on board and started the vaccination process, was... Vaccines were a little bit of the disease that they've put into you and they don't work a lot of the time and they cause lots of terrible reactions which can range from a rash to kill you to whatever. So no, I didn't really believe in sort of the herd immunity thing. I didn't think they really worked. Today, if it, I was 21 and pregnant in 2022, I would be completely different I don't know how different, but it would be a different experience because information, social media is different. Yeah, but I think it might be worse. Yeah, I, I might be. I might have been even more unbearably worse. Yeah. Yeah, there's. There, I mean, I think the misinformation is playing a has more sway now than it ever had. Yeah, I mean, I feel like now if you Google things, you can get so much information. But you know, having said that, even with the algorithms and the things that pop up, it'd probably be. Like I said, the the dodgy vaccination network website here still is number two head on Google. So, you know, I like to think that if it was, it's not so much me, it's the situation. But no, I probably would have just been worse. But no, I didn't really believe in herd immunity. And I really never thought about the fact that I was being incredibly 
privileged and selfish, which is very much what I think now. Following on from that, this is our last topic, our last set of questions, politics and philosophy. From listener JK, what role do you think politics played in your decision? Politics, for me at the time, played no part at all. I don't think politics was ever part of the conversation. Like, this is... This is a COVID thing. There has been, we have never, I, I don't remember in my lifetime, I don't remember any politician having anti-vax as part of their rhetoric. I've never seen that until Trump. And let me clarify too, Trump was not anti-vax. He had some strange ideas and he was pushing other <laughs> agendas. Mm, strange, um, yeah. Ivermectin and hydroquilocrine and what, bleach up his anus, whatever it was. <laughs> But I'm not accusing him of being anti-vax because he was actually quite clear on the vaccination stuff. Mm, I wouldn't say he was quite clear, but he no, got there in the end. No, he wasn't he to told, start with. He was all China virus and all. No, yeah, you know all of that. Know. He was playing every angle he was. But at the end of the day, he did put up the money for the vaccines and he did tell everyone get vaccinated. Yeah, and he still says it today. So yeah, just quietly he says it you know, because all of his fan base. But yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with you. I mean, as anyone who listens to the show regularly, I'm a great supporter of Trump. <laughs> <laughs> But I will, I will give him his dues on this one. He he didn't do a great job at selling the message, but he's not anti-vax. But his supporters mm. and the people around him and the people following him, they definitely jumped on the anti-vax train under the guise of being Trumpers. And I hadn't seen that before in politics. And it, it has become a political divide now. Yeah, I say in that politics didn't play a part. However, in that bubble of family and friends and social networks of everyone who was anti-vax and into all this woo, everybody voted was lefty. There was no, Mm. it wasn't even a question. Mm. Everyone was left and everyone voted for, you know, the Greens or the leftiest lefty. There was 100% every single person I knew. There was no, at that time, I was not aware of anyone even particularly religious and anti-vax, that sort of hadn't happened. Mm. It was much more, you know, I guess the sort of cliche, like hippies who like want to live out in the bush and they go to like doofs and, you know, the forest and they have dreadlocks. Might want to explain what a doof is for everyone who wasn't a teenager in the 90s. Like a a rave in a national park or in the bush. That's good for us Generation Xs. Now, for the... uh, for the boomers and the millennials. Oh, everyone knows what a rave is. No, they don't. They know what a rave is no. or was. Are they still raves? I don't know. No. Just like a big... It's a dance party. Oh, a dance party, outdoors. granddad. Yes, an outdoor dance party. Look, yeah. No, I'm going to stick with dance party. Okay. And you... I'm from the rave generation. I get that. But come on. Well, I... I did, if you said... To... I did the raves and then the doofs. If you said doofs was... to our kids, they'd be like, what are you smoking, mum? No, no, I, I have and they yeah. have... They don't, know, they don't know what that word is. No, they think... And then I try to explain, but if you and, said and they dance walk away. Party, <laughs> they might go, okay, get a dance sh- party. Yeah, they might go, okay, grandma. But do they understand what you're talking about? Yeah, but no, yeah, no. The anti-vax world was always the lefty hippie, alternative medicine, floppy hat wearing, long skirted people who are the classic, you know, people smoking weed on the beach and you know listening to, I don't know, placebo. No. <laughs> Not so Not much placebo. placebo. Whatever, you know, music with the... T- just that was... And everyone was a lefty. Isn't it interesting? I mean, that No, I know. That has swung. been a fascinating the, it, change. The and alt-right have just infiltrated that group in the Trump era and taken it over. And it's full-on neo-Nazis at the rallies. It at is. At the anti-mask, at the anti-vaccination. It's, and uh, I, lived in, I lived in the UK in the very early no- noughts as well. At, well, I was... Before I had my child, but I was still... So I lived there for a year and was in different lefty-based scenes of, I guess, in, in different groups of, like, punks or whatever. But it was all still... White people with dreadlocks. Yeah, there was a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. That was a heavy That's your focus. Crowd. That is, that, that is, is your crowd. It? It's all those. It's all very uncomfortable going back and cropping those photos out now. But no, <laughs> <laughs> very problematic. It's very problematic. So much cultural appropriation. I know. I'm like really glad now that I just never got around to doing that with my hair. But yeah, it was definitely. It's interesting. Yeah, I say it's not political, but it was in that there was no question. Everyone in that world in New Zealand, Australia, and the UK, in my experience that was open to that anti-science, 
open to the witchy sort of stuff also was very open. There was there was no homophobia, transphobia, racism. It was people from different cultures and different ages and everybody if they were gonna vote, obviously they were voting left and we were all very, very unique and different and all very much the same. And 90% of them were not religious at all in a traditional sort of sense. But, yeah, compared to today, mm. that is absolutely... It's the opposite. It's not... When you hear anti-vax, that is not what you think and it's not what you see. As soon as someone says they're anti-vax now, like, it's it's straight away. You can go through your mental checklist. Well, they'll be homophobic. Yeah. They'll be racist. They'll yeah. be all these other things. They'll be a devout, yeah, Christian, yeah. middle-aged, you know, Karen with a gun. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> But yeah, there was a time when it was the complete opposite. Complete that. opposite. Yeah, that yeah. was my whole world. Yeah. Yeah, I never knew another world of that. And so that, I mean, I know you've you've lost touch with a lot of that whole world, but... Yeah, yes and I, no. Yeah, I know, but I wonder how that original, mm. the OG anti-vaxxers, I wonder, I'd really like to know how they are viewing what's happened to their world. Like, I made jokes about it in, in the last um, episode, a pox to you, because... They've been infiltrated, and have they? Has it been a slow absorption? And there's a whole bunch of these hippie mums who don't know that they're at the, a white supremacist rally tomorrow. That's they don't know that that's what they're attending. Yeah, or do they though? No, well, this is the question, isn't it? My experience with seeing what happened is as soon as COVID sort of hit, and people they were like, "Hey, everyone needs to wear masks," or everyone needs to stay home or you can't go overseas. They're all like, um, the fuck you can tell me what to do. And they were so far left. It's that they really, it just like, oh my God, you were already so far left, but actually you're an extreme right. Yeah. Now. Yeah. You go it's, so far left. It's a circle and you end up on the far right. That's it what sounds happens. mental. I but know, but we've seen it. That is what I've seen. And now it's the, these are the same people who 15 years ago were with me barefoot and protesting in the streets and dancing and wearing their Vinnie's clothes and having their dreadlocks. And now they're rubbing shoulders if they're not fully in with the white supremacist groups. And I don't fully get my head around it. Well, that's it. That's it with the questions. I'd like to thank everyone who sent questions in. Obviously, we couldn't. There was like 400 questions, literally. There was actually, it was like 800. Was there? Yeah. Did I miss some? Yeah, there was a whole bunch I sent you. Anyway, I sent you a second email and then no, I, I got, had... I went through them no, as but well. but then I got... Anyway, we'll talk about it later. Oh, it sounds like I'm going to get told about it. Um, <laughs> it's, <laughs> fine. it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. no, it sounds fine. It's fine. But anyway, thank you to everyone who did put in questions. Obviously, we couldn't go through all of them individually, but that brings us to the end of this episode. Anything you'd like to add just before we go? Do you think you've forgot anything? Anything we've missed? Um. Yeah, I think I'll probably you know spend the next few weeks having you know flashbacks to things traumatic memories that you've dredged up from me Whew, yeah well i don't know about you but i'm off to drink some urine right now <laughs> and that's why satan is my superhero if you've enjoyed this episode please rate review subscribe you know the drill but more importantly please recommend the show to just one person i mean literally one person choose that person well For many of us, it is hard to comprehend in this statistics-driven world that some of our fellow citizens can remain so willfully... This is what it's like for I two know. hours. I know. I'm not judging. A little bit. For many of us in this hard 